My guest today is Adi Pollock. Adi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? It's great to be here. Oh, it's great for me to be. It's great for you to be here for me. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, what do you do, Adi? Yeah, so I'm responsible for the DevX team uh, in Triverse, uh, building the community and building educational content for data engineers to learn more about the data ecosystem and the product we're building for data engineers. Oh, so you have a lot of different products at Triverse, is that right? We have only one product, but what we realize is the data engineering space is so big, so we have to be able to explain how this product lives within the ecosystem and how data engineers can benefit from using it together and pairing it with other tools. I see. Well, it makes me feel better because I'm only aware of one product, <laughs> and uh, that, that product was the um, uh, Lake FS. Uh, what, what does the FS stand for? It stands for file system. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Tell me, tell me about LakeFS. What is it? Well, let's let's start with the challenges we're facing as data engineers, and then we can better understand what LakeFS does for us. So, yeah. So, so there's a challenge operating data lakes running on top of object storage. Where is it? S3 or Azure Blob? There's always a huge complexity um, because of all the different moving parts we have in building data pipelines uh, and materializing data to be consumed by analytics or BI or uh, machine learning um, data scientists. Uh, and many times the data is being either streamed or copied over the object stores and there are multi-steps ETL pipelines um, that we take. And we reach that stage where we understand that our consumers are actually consuming the data simultaneously as it being transformed. So for example, if I am now in charge of building an ETL to serve a dashboard uh, that the company is selling, it might be that multiple users are going to interact with that data at the same time. So it's very it's a complicated environment to operate in. Um, and that means that a lot of engineers are spending enormous amount of time and a lot of manual labor of copying, saving, snapshotting uh, the data to make sure it has high quality um, and also prevent errors. And most of us already know in technology, there's the human error factor is, is huge. Um, really? <laughs> no, I've made errors sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And so being able to take this snapshot and create developer environments uh, knowing the complexity of, of the ETL um, and in enabling to run uh, the ETL pipeline separately from production but still leverage production um, data volume variety and velocity uh, this is what LakeFS does. Um, so it solves this critical problem of engineers that needs to develop ETL pipelines, complex pipelines, um, and also help troubleshoot, collaborate, um, and make sure it's high quality. I think it's really hard to do it in, in the space of data manually. Um, okay, so it, it interacts with other data lake stores like uh, Amazon S3 or Azure Blob Storage. Uh, kind of sits on top of that, right? Yeah. No, but not exactly. What it does, it only looks at the metadata of the data, so it doesn't act as a pipeline for the data itself. It's something that we definitely don't want to do. It's too expensive, it's inefficient, uh, etc. So what it does, it only looks at the metadata of what got changed in the data and then present it to the engineer in, in order to take actions. Uh, and actually, the next level on, the, on that is automating the different um, things that the engineer would do uh, with that data to enable high quality of data, for example. Okay, like, so like the ETL workflows, for example. For example, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, well tell me a little about the product itself. You know, how, how does it work and how does it use it? Yeah, so we borrowed the concept that is really known in software development. Uh, we borrowed the concept of Git, like we're doing source control for our software. We want to do source control for our data. And so we have Git for data that uses uh, the same functionalities that we all know and love and Git, 
just it for data. So if I have my main stream of data running in my production environment, I can branch out of the main stream. So not similar to how I'm branching out of code in Git, here I'm branching out of data. And so um, this branch enables me to have an isolated environment where I can run different experimentation, debugging, collaboration, snapshot, all the good things that uh, they, many data engineers today are doing manually. Um, and then there are other functionalities related to Git, like merging back. If, I, if I'm happy with the results, I can merge it back. If I'm not happy with the result, I can roll back. Uh, so I can troubleshoot in, in cases where I need it or I can go to a specific version in time. Uh, so kind of uh, back traveling to a specific uh, timestamp and look at the whole repository and what got changed. And one of the really interesting aspects is that like if I specifically, the Git capabilities are running on binary files. So that means it's schema agnostic, it works with all formats. I can leverage it, you know, no matter what I'm doing, if I'm going with a tabular format, such as for CAT or Avro or CSV, or even if I'm deciding to go with more binary format, PNG and things like that, that exist in images, videos, etc. So I'm always able to run these Git-like operations on top of my object stores, on top of my, my data lake, um, regardless of the data format. Um, which I think it's really interesting. And then there's another functionality that comes from uh, Git uh, and GitHub world. Um, and this is actually uh, the, the merge uh, merge and web hooks. Uh, so similar like we have GitHub Actions, uh, if, uh, we all know and love them, uh, where we can actually develop testing and leverage these actions in order to um, decide, uh, have kind of a programmatically decision-making process on what to do with this new push of software update. Similar thing we can do with data. So if I already have my branching mechanism, I can decide if now I want to test it. I want to have a webhook and decide if I want to merge this uh, branch of data back into my main branch of data uh, so I can expose it to my customers. Uh, and then within that hook, I can do data quality checks. I can do uh, data product requirements checks. Um, so a lot of good capabilities uh, and a tool that enables us to better experience of working with data and also saves us a lot of times and a lot of mistakes and potentially um, even uh, churn of customers, because if at the end of the day we're presenting uh, data that it's uh, not coherent or uh, not reliable, it might mean that it's going to downstream harm our, our business, um, depends on what we're using it for, but again, downstream is going to be a problem. Um, and so having these tools uh, is critical, because today, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but today a lot of data engineers are doing it themselves manually. They will go and copy petabyte of data. So let's say they have 32 tables, they will copy 32 tables and then they will try to merge and maybe 30 out of the 32 will be fine. But then statistics says there's always like two tables that you mess up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah, and that creates a lot of um, problems later on uh, for the business because we need to justify why this data is corrupted. Right, so so the webhooks are basically triggers that you can run prior to merging your changes back into, uh, I'll call it the main branch, so using GitHub terms here. Uh, uh, and, the, and you do things like uh, check, validate that the data is in a has some level of quality. What's an example of a quality check that you run? Yeah, so for example, let's say I'm developing, um, my data product needs to expose um, data that is, uh, I, I have a high level understanding of the statistics of the distributed of the data. So I know I have a data scientist that really understand the data domain, uh, and I wanna be able to expose data that is within somehow the statistics, because otherwise there's a huge skew uh, in my data, for example. Uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, and, and this is unfortunate, but we've seen a lot of biases in machine learning uh, workloads because the data itself was skewed and didn't really represent what's happening in the world. Um, there is some biases towards uh, gender biases or authenticity biases, etc. 
Um, so a, a data scientist who has the qualification, who really understand the world and, and the data domain can put down a set of rules saying, hey, you know, in this data, I have to have this percentage of female, this percentage of male or people that identify as, as female or male uh, from so and so ethnicity, because this is the population that we're working with. And so I can programmatically insert it into my hooks and write a code that says, OK, this is this is what came back from the computation. I know there is a dedicated range, and I, I am expecting to have so and so people identify as females, so and so people identify as males, um, etc. Inside this hook. So when I am exposing this data later on for machine learning workload or analytics workload. Um, I can make sure it doesn't have biases in it. Um, and if there are biases in it, I can go back and validate my process. Like, where did the data start? Did I lose some data? Assuming, you know, I got the data right in the beginning, maybe there is a place where I lose some data. Maybe I, I duplicated the data, and this is a big problem. Data duplication is, is always a huge problem uh, in writing ATLs. Um, or maybe there were some corrupted records that I just dropped. I decided to filter it because my logic in my ATL saying, hey, if you see corrupted records, just drop them. But hey, I just realized all the people that identify as females uh, somehow got corrupted data. And so I don't have any females presenting representation in, in my analytics. Um, so that can be a problem. Um, yeah, just one example. And it's very much uh, connected to the business goals. So it's really critical to sit down and really lay out what the, pro the, the data product requirements specifics are um, and then programmatically insert them into the hooks. Uh, interesting. Uh, now what, what's the experience like for the data scientists or the developers using this? Is there a, a command line tool? Is there a user interface or programmatic interface or what? Yeah, uh, so we decided to give all the options um, and really let the community decide what they want to do and how to use it because it's an open source. Everyone can go in and, you know, put the request for specific features or even develop these features themselves. Um, so we have a UI, so it's easy to to go in and really see what's happening in my, in my repository. Where, what are my branches? What got changed? If I need to commit a specific change, uh, etc. If there's any... Um, changes in, in the file size as well. I, I can look at them and understand what, what happened there. Um, there is the CLI, because we know a lot of developers love CLI. Uh, so there is the CLI as well, so we can work directly from the command line in order to operate on top of these branches. Um, and then there is SDK, because we want to be able to programmatically work with this tool in order to make sure we are inco incorporating it into uh, the way we're managing our data, into the way we're managing these ETLs uh, and making programmatic decisions um, based on, you know, which branch do we want to merge back, for example, uh, and developing the hooks uh, within them. Uh, so all of these capabilities are available. Uh, and since it's an open source, we would love for everyone here uh, to jump in and, you know, tell us what more they want to see it so we can make it even better for them. Oh, uh, if it's open source, are you also taking pull requests from the community? Yes. Yes, very much so. Appreciate pull requests, feature requests, uh, stars. Um, let us know if you like it. It's, you know, there's a lot of contributors that works on that. Some of them work for Traverse, some of them people from the community who wants to contribute and really innovate in that space. Uh, so let us know what you think. We always appreciate it. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, open source suggests that uh, people can use it for free, um, uh, sure. but also you, there's uh, you're a commercial company, you're a for-profit company. What's the is there a pricing model or a, a freemium model that um, works for this product? Yeah, so. Um we believe in open source and we believe in communities. And you're right, this is a commercial uh, company and it's for profit uh, and we're building it uh, in that manner. So we believe in giving all the functionalities for free. So the core of LakeFS, the versioning engine, uh, the different functionalities, uh, et cetera, everything is available for developers to take and, and use uh, under the Apache 2.0 license. Um, so you can use it for commercial, you can use it for a hobby. Go ahead, you can contribute if you wish to, it's all open. 
uh, the commercial part of it, and this is the product that we're now launching, uh, this is the LakeFS cloud. And this is a managed solution for LakeFS because LakeFS is a distributed system. Uh, we believe that uh, many people um, would want to use it and love it, and many people are using and love it. We have more than a thousand companies already uh, adopting it into their data workloads, uh, and more than four four thousand uh, community members that loves it and, and work together with us in order to innovate that space. Uh, so we realized that some companies would prefer to lean into uh, the open source solution. Some engineers would prefer to manage it themselves in the cloud and. and use it but some companies uh would prefer to actually buy a managed version and that's perfectly fine they would prefer to buy the sas because managing this specific open source is not part of their business not part of the core business and they don't want to get devops or engineers uh working on it and that's perfectly fine but they still need it in order to serve the data engineers to make sure they're not uh harming the product from mistakes and also help them um, create better workloads and operate at a higher level and, and optimize all the work that they do. So this is how this is how we see it. Everything is open. The functionality is the features, the engine, um, the SDK, the CLI, the UI. Everything is open and similar in between the two versions. Um, only when the commer on the commercial version, what we give you is we kind of give you the keys to the already managed environment. That, uh, Trevers makes it, you know, manage it and build the control plane and make sure it's um, it's scalable uh, to scale it as as you need, etc. Um, however, we're not blocking any functionality. All the functionality uh, and all the core uh, is available for everyone who loves and want to use open source in their production. Excellent. Um, where can people go to learn more and get started with this tool? Yeah, so first of all, we're on, on GitHub, right? We're, <laughs> the project is available under Treeverse uh, slash LakeFS uh, on GitHub, and we will share the links as well. We also have a website, so LakeFS.io. You can go there, and there's a tab for the community, a tab for the documentation, a tab for GitHub. So you can go in and really dive and learn and read about it. You're most welcome to join our community on Slack as well if you're curious and want to learn more and you're not sure where to start. Uh, we have a really lovely, vibrant uh, Slack community. A lot of people really help each other learn and, and grow and adopt these best practices for the data space because we realize that we have to work together uh, because it's tough being a data engineer today. Um, so we are working together, we are helping each other in the Slack channel to learn about new tools as well as adopt and make better decisions about data architecture. Uh, so these are all, all places and you're most welcome to connect with me also on LinkedIn if you have any questions or you want to jump on a call to learn more. I'm always available, always happy to, to share what I know and what I learned from uh, decade of experience working in the data space. I will connect with you today if I have not already done so. Let's do it. I see there's also a blog here on the LakeFS page uh, that's pretty active. A couple times a month, blog posts are being added to this. Yes. We just finished writing uh, what, I'm going, what I think is going to believe um, one of the best articles we produced this year. Uh, and this is the landscape of data engineering in 2022, what's available, uh, what's happening in the industry, really good view of uh, the different companies, the size, the ecosystem, what got changed, where are we today, where we think this industry is going. Um, a lot of great minds worked on it together. It was a collaboration between Treeverse and a couple of other companies uh, that sat down in order to realize where this industry is going and also how to better help data engineers make the most out of their data and really, you know, acknowledging the pain that's available today that's unfortunately exists today in the industry. Um, so a lot to look forward, I look to. forward to. that. Is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Um, I think we covered a lot of great things. We're always producing more content. So if you want to learn about data engineering and some of the best practices, uh, we are now working on a, on a new concept, a new architecture that speaks about uh, data lifecycle management, which really helps us understand how we can manage 
data over object stores, over data lake. We know this is something, this is a concept that is highly available in traditional um, databases, but it wasn't really applied in the world of data lakes, for example. And we, we noticed there's a lot of pain there. So we're trying to kind of help people understand how they can build better architecture while leveraging uh, these principles and this paradigm and, and making sure they're able to manage their data, their production data in a way that it's scalable, secure, efficient, um, and all of this good stuff that already available for us in databases, but we completely forgot about, <laughs> or, you know, due to some challenges in technologies, we, we didn't address uh, in data stores till today. Excellent. Another thing to look forward to. Yeah. Adi, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I've learned a lot today. Thank you so much. Yeah, likewise, David. Thank you so much. It was lovely to be with you today. Technology innovation is better done with friends. <laughs>